Welcome to the Healthy, Wealthy, and Smart Podcast. Each week, we interview the best and brightest in physical therapy, wellness, and entrepreneurship. We give you cutting-edge information you need to live your best life, healthy, wealthy, and smart. The information in this podcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be used as personalized medical advice. And now, here's your host, Dr. Karen Litzy. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, Karen Litzy, and today's episode is brought to you by NetHealth. So NetHealth has a brand new online therapy community that is designed for the intersection of the clinical and business sides of rehab. It's called the Rehab Therapy Operational Best Practices Forum, and it's all about habits and initiatives that can help up your attendance, your revenue, your workflows, your documentation, compliance, efficiency, and engagement, while allowing your provider teams and yourself to keep your eye on the prize, your patients, and your outcomes. So if you want more information and you want to join, which I highly suggest you should, jump in, subscribe, and join the conversations. You can find the Rehab Therapy Operational Best Practices Forum at www.nethealth.com slash healthy. All right, on to today's episode. I am so happy to have on today Dr. Mohamed Ramawi. He brings a wealth of knowledge and expertise to Grand Central Foot Care in Midtown East Murray Hill and the surrounding New York City area, so a fellow New Yorker. As a board-qualified foot, rear foot, and reconstructive ankle surgeon with specializations in traumatic foot and ankle injuries and complex deformities, He is able to offer his patients top-tier care no matter what problem they bring him. He earned his doctorate from the New York College of Podiatric Medicine where he made his mark. Not only did he graduate above the 90th percentile of his class and serve as class president for four years, he was also recognized with the Student Service Award. That award goes to the student voted by the graduating class as making the biggest impact on the field of podiatry. Beyond his peers' recognition, Dr. Ramawi was inducted into the Pi Delta Honor Society for Achievements in Research and His Studies. Dr. Ramawi continued on to a three-year reconstructive foot and ankle surgery residency at DeKalb Medical Center and Jefferson Health. His colleagues at the hospital and staff at the latter named him Podiatric Residents of the Year. He is a published author and accomplished lecturer, as well as Associate of American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons, And in his spare time, where I don't know where he finds it, he manages to carve out. He loves to read, hike, and root for his favorite sports teams. So on today's episode, we discuss the anatomy of the foot and ankle, the most common foot and ankle injuries, the difference between a high ankle sprain and low ankle sprain, which was great, the importance of the diabetic foot check, and when surgery may be an appropriate intervention with so much more little take-home tidbits on how the health of the foot can be a reflection of your overall health. So I want to thank Dr. Ramawi for coming on to today's episode, and everyone enjoy. Hey, Dr. Ramawi, welcome to the podcast. I'm happy to have you on. Hi, thank you for having me. And so today we're going to be talking about the importance of foot and ankle health and the overall well-being of a person. And you are a doctor. You specialize in the foot and ankle. So before we get going, can you fill in some of the blanks for us and let the listeners know why you, what sparked your interest in this part of the body? Sure. Actually, you know, it's fascinating. When I was growing up, I was very active as a child. I played three different sports. I I always kept moving. I was very active. And actually, uh, I was a chronic ankle sprainer, just always had ankle sprains. And, you know, I just... uh, Everybody just told me you were goofy, you're imbalanced, there's so forth and so forth. No one actually gave me a, a, a real answer. And it turns out that one of the ankle sprains actually tore a very significant ligament in my uh, ankle, and it never healed properly. And the fact that I was never properly evaluated or treated definitely hindered my progression in the sports world. So I always felt this need to kind of indulge in the foot and ankle and uh, try to make sure that it doesn't happen to a fellow person, you know. So that's where my interest sparked in it. And I kind of just ran with it from there. And that's usually, it seems every time I ask that question, the, that the usual answer is, well, this happened to me yeah, and that's what sparked the interest. Um, so not uncommon, go ahead. No, not uncommon. And you know, I, I always admired people who always had that story because you knew they were passionate about their job. You know, when they, when they have that personal touch to their craft, it it makes the difference in my opinion. 
Yeah, I don't disagree. And now let's talk about why the foot and ankle complex is so important to the well-being of the rest of the body. So before we go into that, let's talk a little bit, maybe you can share a little bit with the about the structure of the foot and ankle and what exactly it does for us. Yeah, so I think I'm going to start off with a quote by uh, Da Vinci when he said it best. He said, the human foot is a masterpiece of engineering and a work of art. And this was way ahead of his time because if you break down just the foot alone and you look at the pieces it's made up of, so each foot contains 26 bones each. Each one has over 100 ligaments, tendons, and muscles. Um, each one has nine compartments in such a small anatomical structure. And together, they compromise one-fourth of your uh, human bony anatomy. And you look at that and you think never to think that all this was compromised in your foot. And the average human will surpass 150,000 miles walking. You'll take about 10,000 steps a day. And this is the person who isn't active. So we're not including running. We're not including cycling, hit training, sports, and so what, so forth. So with those kind of numbers staggering, it's, it, it only makes sense that you should pay attention to your feet and what they're saying. Um, over 90% of people will experience some sort of foot problem less than half of them will ever address it. And yeah, if that's you, for sure. Yeah, and if you look at the, the elderly population, if you ever spoke to anyone in a senior care or a hospital that deals with a lot of elderly, one of the biggest things they're fearful of is falls. You know, mm -hmm. proper imbalance, the trauma, they fall, they get a subdural hematoma, and it just starts this slippery slope of issues. And it personally, uh, I always wanted to indulge to see if this proper imbalance began way before they became the elderly, you know, way before, but it was just never properly addressed. So I think it's very, very important if you, and not just to the foot, but anywhere in your body. If something feels off, I think that's your body trying to tell you that, hey, maybe something's going on. And it, it doesn't hurt anyone to get it checked. You know, I have patients here who come all the time who have family members or loved ones that go through certain foot and ankle issues, whether they be diabetic or ath athletes and so forth. And they go, doc, I'm just here for a checkup. I just want you to take a look at me, see the way I walk, do some muscle strength testing, and let me know, is everything okay? And I think that's very proper. I think it's very stout that someone would do such a thing. And from what you see in your practice, what are the most common foot and ankle problems? So, you know, I'm in the heart of Grand Central, right across the street from the terminal. And over here, everybody walks. You know, I know there's taxis and Ubers, but walking is the mainstay of transportation here. So a common thing I see is uh, plantar fasciitis, which is basically anything with an itis indicates inf inflammation. So there's this ligamentous type structure on the bottom of your foot, and it's called the plantar fascia. And it has various responsibilities, one of them maintaining the arch and stability of your foot. Over prolonged uh, walking or walking in improper shoe gear, which is what most of us do down here in the city with heels, flats, dress shoes, the plantar fascia just gets exhausted and says, I need to stop this. And the patients come in and they they're in excruciating pain. They say, my heel is hurting. I have no idea why. Please help. So plantar fasciitis is by far the number one thing we see here. Mm -hmm. Another common thing we see here, you know, New York isn't very forgiving. The terrain is, is bumpy. The sidewalks aren't the best. So a lot of people sprain their ankles a lot a lot and uh they come in here and they come their ankles look like a balloon it's puffed up and they're saying ah you know i was told to walk it off because everybody has this adage back in school just walk it off tighten your sneakers you'll be okay and necessarily that's not the case you know your soft tissues if you look at the importance of a ligament and holding two bones together and making sure that they don't separate or dislocate it takes a lot of force to injure that so for you to have pain after a sprain means it's significant even even if it's not um, a break, a sprain alone can take you out of commission for two to four weeks with ease. You know, uh, ligaments in itself, they take two to three weeks to fully scar in to the potential that they once were. And uh, if you avoid that, you can make it worse later on. If you ignore those symptoms, it's, it's problematic. And another thing people do uh, when they get something like an ankle sprain is they go and follow the RICE modality. Everybody's heard of RICE, the acronym, mm -hmm. RICE ice, compression, elevation. They'll do that for the weekend and the inflammatory markers within three days will decrease drastically and they'll think, hey, 
I'm good. I'm fine. I feel better than I did three days ago and I'm, I'm ready to go at it. And to me, that's the body tricking you. You know, as we know, tendons, ligaments, any soft tissue structure really need about 14 to 21 days to regain proper strength. So what happens is when the inflammatory markers are extremely high, you're in pain, you're in agony, you're in discomfort. By day three to five, those markers tend to die down. So in comparison to the start of the injury, sure, you feel better. But are you at your best to go about going through your day and uh, normal cycles? Probably not. So I always tell my patients, you're going to feel better in a week. I still need you to follow up with this protocol and come back after. Now, some of them do, some of them don't. What they'll do is they'll come back six months later and say, doc, I still have this pain. And that's the reality. You never gave that ligament or tendon enough time to heal. So again, it's all about paying attention to your body's calling. If your body says something's wrong, chances are it is. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And oftentimes people like they just go by the pain, but maybe not by the function. And after two or three days after a good ankle sprain, uh, I don't think you have the function back. You don't have the proprioception back around the ankle. Um, and for those listening who aren't in the healthcare field, um, maybe you don't have the, uh, balance you had before. Right. And I think these are oftentimes things that need to be addressed by the doctor, by the therapist, uh, so that, like you said, six months down the line, they're not coming back and saying, you know, my ankle's still not healed. It's been six months. Yeah. And you know, you, you said such a great word, word, uh, proprioception. So proprioception is very key for me in the rehab process. So key. So proprioception is the way your body, uh, feels itself in, in space. You know, when you close your eyes and it's, you're kind of tilting, that's proprioception right there. And in the ligamentous world, when you sprain your ankle, I always include that in my rehab process. So after you do your act, your passive range of motion and you're freely moving your ankle, then you're active, you're adding some weights. I always tell the physical therapist, please include proprioceptive training because chances are, if you have a certain foot type or you're prone to ankle injuries, if we don't teach you that balance, you're going to re-injure that ankle at some point. And that was actually my problem, you know, and no one ever addressed this for me. So I was constant. My left ankle would always, always turn in. It wasn't until I finally learned about it that I realized I just needed to do better proprioceptive training, better balancing, better uh, mobility in that ankle. So I always, always include that. I never treat an ankle sprain as something like I always make sure I do all that I can so they don't have this issue uh, again. Yeah, for sure. And can you kind of quickly uh, give the listeners uh, kind of differentiate between a high ankle sprain and your traditional ankle sprain? So, yeah, that's a great, great question. We see this all the time in sports injuries, right? They diagnose mm -hmm. them with a high ankle sprain or an ankle sprain. You're like, oh, what's the difference? So there's a, a complex of ligaments that make up your ankle joint. There's one on the outside of the ankle, one in the middle that keeps the bones together, and then one on the inside of the ankle. The one on the inside is very strong. Wrong and rarely sprained or ruptured. You know, you have to really do a number on yourself to hurt those ligaments. Mm -hmm. The one on the outside, we hurt very often, very often. In fact, 85% of Americans will, will experience some sort of ankle sprain in their lifetime. That's the one where you're just walking and your ankle kind of just turns in. Those ligaments aren't as strong. They're made up of three ligaments, and one of them is called the uh, ATFL. That ligament is very commonly injured, torn, and sometimes even ruptured. Rarely do you ever address this acutely with surgery. You tend to let it scar in and then work on the rehab after. So that is a traditional ankle sprain. A high ankle sprain, there's something called the syndesmotic ligament. Now that holds your two big bones, uh, two of the three bones in the ankle together called the tibia and the fibula. That's a very, very strong ligament. And when you sprain that ankle, you did a high end energy, uh, energy injury to kind of really disrupt that. And that takes a little more time than your traditional ankle injury to uh, heal. And the only way to properly diagnose between one or the other is a physical examination. There's certain exams that will kind of lead us towards a high ankle sprain or a uh, traditional ankle sprain. And then radiographic examination, whether it be x-ray or MRI. Um, but it's very, very important. I'm glad you mentioned that to distinguish between the two because the rehab is actually different as well. Mm -hmm. And what sort of tests are you looking at to differentiate between a high and a low ankle sprain? So a low ankle sprain, it's really palpation, right? I'm doing stress inversions, which is I'm basically taking that ankle, recreating the injury and palpating each individual ligament. And if there's pain on those uh, palpations, then it tells 
me, okay, it's the ATFL, the CFL, and very uncommonly the PFL. So that, that lets me know. Then the syndesmotic, you're not only are you palpating the syndesmosis in between the two bones, but you're doing something called the external rotation test. And you're doing something called a syndesmotic squeeze test. Those two, when you perform those tests in a clinical setting, will kind of gauge you to say, oh, my God, this is a, this is a high ankle sprain. And, you know, with, with the patient's history, if you pay attention, they'll kind of tell you which one they have. So if a patient comes in and says, I turned my ankle, you're a little more uh, going towards the end of a traditional one. But if a patient says, hey, you know, my ankle actually turned and externally rotated, I'm thinking high ankle sprain. And is our high ankle sprains more likely to happen during kind of high velocity exercises or can someone who's just walking down the street, maybe step in a pothole, have a high ankle sprain as well? Sure. You can step in a, a, a pothole and have one. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. But traditionally, it's going to be high energy. We're Got talking it. about our basketball players, our football players. You know, Ben Roethlisberger, there's a, I'm sure there's a video on YouTube, had one a couple of years ago before the playoffs. And it was a nasty injury. Nasty. So um, these are things that obviously are high energy. And, you, you know, the, the clinical or the history will kind of gauge you towards them. But again, I think it's key what you said. It's We have to differentiate between the two because the rehab could be way different. Right. Absolutely. And when I have one other question on uh, the high ankle sprain versus the traditional ankle sprain, and that is, is the presentation of the patient different? You know, the low ankle, the traditional ankle sprain, you could kind of pinpoint it. So they'll both present swollen. They'll mm-hmm. both say I'm swollen, mm-hmm. but the bruising will be different. Sometimes the bruising on the outside would indicate a traditional ankle sprain. Um, and then the palpation test. I mean, you can't, you know, your hands are key in this, in this examination, mm-hmm. you're going to touch. So what I do is I literally touch each individual ligament. This is why anatomy is important. You want to know where the ligament starts and where it inserts. This way you ride along the ligament and you touch them. Okay, this one, this one, this one. And that'll kind of gauge you towards uh, which one is really injured. And I just want to mention before we move forward, you know, the one thing that's constantly, constantly overlooked in the setting of an ankle sprain is the perineal tendons that tend to be right behind the ankle ligaments. Everybody completely forgets that they are also injured in an ankle sprain and sometimes could be the root of the problem. So I always make sure to palpate the two perineal tendons that ride, around, ride along the back of the uh, outside of the ankle as well. Mm-hmm. And what, what will that tell you in relationship to the ankle sprain? Just another layer perhaps of something that can affect rehab and function in the future? Sure. or. You, you got it right on, on the point. So the thing about ligaments and tendons, you know, the beauty, even if you got one or missed the, the other one in the acute setting, like meaning when you first saw them, the treatment is kind of the same. So you could get away with making a mistake initially because you're going to put them in a boot. You're going to rest them for a couple of weeks, whether it be tendon or ligament, it's, it's the same thing. What makes it different and what you hit it is the rehab right? When you're retraining your ankle for the ankle ligaments or when you're retraining the ankle for the perineals, you're going to have to focus on different things. And I'm sure as a therapist, you can vouch for that and tell us different things that you do for perineal strengthening and things you do for ankle strengthening. Mm -hmm. So that's where it matters, right? Because, um, you know, the, the idea, you know, preventative medicine is the best medicine. So when Mm -hmm. someone comes in with an injury, I think our goal should be, okay, how can I make sure they don't re-injure themselves this similar manner that's of course that's, yeah yeah of course and on that note we're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsor are you interested in a free opportunity to check in with the latest thoughts of other rehab leaders well i've got one for you there's a new online rehab therapy community designed for the intersection of the clinical and business sides of rehab it's the rehab therapy operational best practices forum catchy name right It's all about habits and initiatives that juice up your attendance, revenue, workflows, documentation, compliance, efficiency, and engagement, while allowing your provider teams to keep their eye on the prize, their patients, and outcomes. I personally believe that a better connected rehab therapy profession has the power to help more people. Jump in, subscribe, and join the conversation today. You can find the Rehab Therapy Operational Best Practices Forum at www.nethealth.com slash healthy. 
How about people with uh, diabetes, either type 1 or type 2 diabetes? Mm -hmm. I always, whenever I'm with patients, they ask me about uh, diabetes. They have questions about diabetes. I always say that one of the most important things diabetics have to do is check their feet. So could you just kind of tell us why that is? Oh, diabetes is such a debilitating disease. I mean, you know, once the effects of diabetes hits, they're almost always irreversible. Right. So the idea why we tell people check your feet is diabetes sometimes causes this thing called neuropathy. Neuropathy is the loss of sensation in in your feet and in different areas of your body. When you have lost the sensation, you may not notice things that other people notice, including pain. So uh, when I was in residency, it wouldn't be uncommon to see someone with a nail up their foot or uh, glass all over the bottom of their feet because they don't they have no feeling in that sensation so that's why it's important for their loved ones to look at their feet every night say oh my god is something different another thing is healing diabetes uh, causes uh, problems at the vascular level as well and unfortunately the foot specifically the toes are the furthest away from the heart you Tag team that with diabetes, which causes the blood vessels to thin or uh, glycosylate, which means so much sugar and junk fills up your blood vessels that not enough can get to the areas where they need. I mean, it's a recipe for disaster. And that's why people with diabetes are more prone to something called gangrene, which is basically there's no blood flow to your toes and they basically die. They just die off. Mm -hmm. Um, Another thing, diabetes, uh, you know, in a holistic approach, they're more common for retinopathy, meaning their eyesight diminishes, their kidney function diminishes as well. So diabetes, even when they come in with pre-diabetic, they say, doc, I'm pre-diabetic. I tell them it doesn't matter unless you get your A1C, which is the three month measurement of how uh, well your sugar is controlled. I want you to check your feet every single day. Um, And, you know, they do it really lovely in these big centers because diabetes is a really holistic approach. You can't just uh, be a podiatrist and look at the foot. You have to tell the patient, I could do as much work as I can on the foot for you. I could do as much as I can. But if you don't control your sugars, your lifestyle, your diet and your habits, nothing will help. You know, um, and that's why it's it's a multi team approach. You always have a vascular doctor on board. You always have a primary doctor on board. You always have a, a nutritionist, and so forth and so forth. Because you have to attack the body as a whole. And I think for specialists, we kind of make this mistake sometimes where we get so zoned in on the foot. Um, so if a diabetic presents with a wound, we just care for the wound without ever questioning. You know, how are your sugars doing? You know, how's your blood flow been? And so forth and so forth. Yeah, oftentimes we can kind of get siloed into our specialties, but I think the team approach to any patient, regardless of uh, diagnosis, is always best for the person that matters the most, and that's the patient. I I agree. And we spoke about this uh, off the record, uh, um, establishing uh, ties with other professions is important because you always want that means of communication. You know, when someone sends me a patient, I always make sure to send them either an email or a letter in the mail saying, hey, this is what I did and this is where they're at, just so they know and they're in the loop. Um, And I think it's very important in the podiatric or the injury realm and physical therapist as well. Mm -hmm. I think they should they should be hand in hand. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And now, uh, what? Uh, let's talk about maybe one other uh, common foot and ankle injury that you see um, that maybe needs surgical intervention. Because you have, you know, you're a foot and ankle surgeon as well. Yes. So, what is something common? that people will come to you for that needs surgical intervention. So they've tried rehab, um, other inter- conservative interventions did not work. So when is the, when is uh, what's an example of something that yeah. needs more of a surgical that, intervention? That's a, that's a great, 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 great question. So even though my specialty is surgery and I love surgery more than anything, I rarely jump the gun on surgery, right? Because at the end of the day, this is a patient we're talking about and we have to try our best to avoid anything. Surgery, surgery. But there are some instances where a patient comes in and I say, I'm sorry, like we're going to have to do surgery here. Uh, The most common thing I see is something called a Liz Frank's injury. And that's uh, unfortunately commonly misdiagnosed as a midfoot sprain. Uh, And the Liz Frank ligament, just to give you guys a background, is one of the most important complexes for making sure your midfoot is stable. When you lose the most primary ligament, that makes the whole complex unstable. 
And unfortunately, that's one of the things that you just kind of jump to surgery for, because if it heals, it's going to heal in an unstable state and your stability decreases drastically over time, especially if you're young and athletic. Um, so that is one thing I always, always, always tell the patient, Hey, I, I never jumped the gun, but for a midfoot, for a midfoot ligamentous, uh, Liz Frank injury, I think we should go to, uh, the surgical setting for this one. Um, as another one, depending on who the patient is, is something called a Jones fracture. So a Jones fracture is a fracture in the fifth metatarsal, which is the bone on the outside of the foot. Now, the fifth metatarsal is unique because depending where you break the bone will kind of dictate whether you should do surgery or not. So there's a, a small section of that bone that is very avascular in nature. It doesn't have much blood supply there and doesn't tend to do well if you he if you let it heal on its own or it tends to be weaker than it was before so for an a young athletic person who breaks this part of that bone i kind of tell them hey chances are i could put you in a cast for six to eight weeks and you'll heal but studies have shown that you just do better with surgery for this kind of condition so those are two injuries that i, I kind of jumped the gun to surgery i'm sure there's more but i'm just thinking in my practice what i deal with and the last one um which is kind of debatable now because uh everything i do is based off research uh based medicine i think you know you should always keep up with the times so another thing that for us when we were coming up was um achilles ruptures right Achilles mm -hmm. ruptures were like, yeah, do surgery on them. You, you approximate the end of the rupture and you let them heal that way and you, you move forward with rehab as you go on. But now studies have shown that, you know what, sometimes if you just let them uh, in a cast, in a plantar flex cast, you may not need surgery. So when someone comes in with an Achilles rupture, we tend to go over the MRI results and our options uh, more in depth. But again, if they're young and athletic, I kind of tend to tell them, hey, if I was you, I would go the surgical route. However, if they're old and sedentary, I, I would probably leave them in a cast at this point, just with the research that's out there now. So uh, I'm sure there's more and people listening to this podcast are going to say, well, what about this and that? I, this is just the three things off the top mm -hmm. of my head that come here. And now, is there anything that maybe we didn't go over that you really want the listeners to take away with them? Yeah, you know, there's just some general things um, that, you know, we talked about some great topics here, but I want people to understand that you know it, your body is constantly trying to maintain the state of homeostasis the state of equal equal balance you know so when something is off and we mentioned this before listen to it and the feet specifically they can be the window to your overall health we talked about diabetes correct um so the loss of hair on your toes or loss of hair on your foot kind of almost indicates some circulatory problem the cramping some people say oh I, I cramp in my foot sometimes sure that can be soft tissue in nature but more than likely it may be dehydration it may be that you have a nutritional balance specifically uh potassium calcium magnesium um red hot swollen toes you know this isn't something oh i walk two miles that's why it's red and hot and swollen no pay attention to it it could be gout it could be an infection um losing sensation in your feet we spoke about this before that could be diabetes it could be a nutrition deficiency it could be alcoholism uh scale itchy feet don't always mean uh, fungal infection they could sometimes mean psoriasis you know holes in the nails doesn't mean poor hygiene sometimes that's also another indication for psoriasis uh, constantly cold feet, no matter what you do, are a big sign for hypothyroidism. And what I'm trying to do with these examples is to let you know that there's certain things that we can find about, find out about your overall health just from a proper foot examination. So if you, there are some warning signs or there are some symptoms, feel free to get them checked out. You know, at least you do your part and then let us take care of the rest. I love that. I love all of those uh, great takeaways for people. That's easy. Yeah, 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 right? yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, easy. it's easy to look at all of that and say, hmm, you know, this might not be right. So let me go get this checked out. Right. 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 And I know, I know, especially in New York, you know, we get caught up with everything. It's such a hectic t place to be here, but you know, nothing goes over your health and um, you have to find time for it. I mean, these examinations uh, can take as little as 10 to 15 minutes. So if you could find 10 to 15 minutes in your day, I think it's worth it. 
Yeah, it sounds like it. <laughs> sounds like it to me. Well, this was yeah. great. Thank you so yeah. much. No, thank you for having me. I appreciate being here. Yeah. Now, before we uh, sign off here and find out where people can find you, yep. uh, I'm going to ask the same question I ask everyone, and that's knowing where you are now in your practice and in your life, what advice would you give to yourself as a new graduate? Um, the best advice I can give to anybody, and I mean this wholeheartedly, is to uh, brace yourself. You know, people get so caught up with uh, being a doctor or being a physician or a specialist that you don't realize the road to get here can be uh, overwhelming at times. You know, you're trying to balance your schooling career. You're trying to balance everything at home and so forth. So it sometimes weighs heavy on you. But you have to constantly remember the end goal in all of this and keep just moving. So I, I think brace yourself is, would be the best advice because there are going to be times where you're just at your low points and you're thinking, what am I doing this for? But you have to constantly remind yourself that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And now that I've graduated and uh, I'm in private practice, I could assure anybody listening that the, there is a light. You know, your hard work doesn't go unnoticed and uh, just continue striving. And I'm always here for questions or any comments or concerns. Fantastic advice. And speaking of that, where can people find you? Yeah, so my practice is located on 122 East 42nd Street. It's literally right across the street from uh, Grand Central Terminal. Uh, I, we have a beautiful view of it here, so it's uh, across the street exactly. Uh, our phone number is 212-697-3293. We're currently accepting new patients, and um, feel free to contact us at any time. Cool. And how about on social media? So my Instagram page is NYC foot doc doc. I try to post uh, relevant content to the foot and ankle health, whether it be for runners, cyclers, and so forth. And just uh, regular things to make people smile, hopefully. So I, I hope you appreciate the positive attitude on that page. Uh, feel free to contact me through there uh, as well. I try to be very, very courteous of uh, replying to everybody. Awesome. And I can attest to that. Uh, <laughs> so, thank you so much for coming on the, sh on the podcast. I almost said the show. I never say that. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. No, I appreciate you having me so much. Thank you. Yeah. And for everyone that's listening, all of the links to all the information we talked about today will be on the podcast website in the show notes under this episode. So you can go to podcast.healthywealthysmart.com and you can get all of the info that uh, we talked about in today's episode. So again, a big thank you to all of you for listening. Have a great week and stay healthy, wealthy, and smart. And a big thank you to Dr. Romawi for coming on to today's episode and giving us so much great, useful, practical information. So hopefully you all were taking notes. And of course, a huge thank you to the sponsor for today's episode, NetHealth. Like I said in the beginning, they have a new online community for rehab professionals called the Rehab Therapy Operational Best Practices Forums. You'll see stats on the community members already involved, plus some new polls just launched, and we'd love for you to weigh in. So what can you expect that will benefit you? Write-ups, white papers from leading-edge performers, polls, surveys, benchmarking calculators, videos, podcasts, and more. So we believe that a better connected rehab therapy community is better for everyone, including our patients. You can find the Rehab Therapy Operational Best Practices Forum at www.nethealth.com slash healthy. Thank you for listening, and please subscribe to the podcast at podcast.healthywealthysmart.com. And don't forget to follow us on social media.